you're like, man, there's nobody here. It's all right. It's all right. Amen. Amen. We got to praise God regardless. We're going to praise God till the day Jesus comes back. Amen? Amen. We shouldn't be worried about who comes and who doesn't. Because as long as we're praising God, we are to be excited because the Sabbath is here. And we are to praise Jesus no matter what. Amen. I'm excited. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. Um, this message, maybe it's for us. <clears throat> maybe it's for us. And I'm going to preach it like if there's a hundred people here. Amen. If there's like a thousand people here. Because that's what I felt the Lord impressed me to share with you guys. Um, I don't doubt. I don't doubt. Because um, I've been studying the Word lately. And God has been revealing a lot of things to me. That um, when we start to doubt. Then things don't happen. Amen. When we, don't, when we start to doubt. Things do not happen. God is ready to bless us. God is ready to... Um, God is ready to fill this church up. Amen. Um, we just got to be willing. We got to do our part. Amen. And step out in faith. We got to get out of our comfort zone. We got to start telling people about Jesus. Amen. And uh, the minute we do that, this place is going to be full. I have an announcement in two weeks. Not this Sabbath coming up, but the following week on Saturday. And I'm going to try to invite a lot of people. Uh, we're going to have Brother Isaiah. Carter, he's gonna have, uh, he's gonna do uh, praise and worship music. He's gonna do, uh, he's gonna play the piano and he's gonna do his music here Saturday, um, January the 18th, I believe. So y'all try to invite as many people as y'all can. Try to invite many, as many people as y'all can. Uh, we will be blessed by the music that he uh, he does. And also, I'm going to try to prepare a special sermon for that Sabbath. I'll just leave it up to the Holy Spirit on what I should present that Sabbath. Um, God is amazing. God is awesome. Um, I just, I remember uh, I sent a, I sent my wife the other day a uh, Bible verse that said, or no, I posted it on Facebook. That um, when we are feeling down, when we're going through things, sometimes it's a time of testing, that we are to praise God. We praise God because when we're praising God and we're in the middle of the presence of God, He removes all that doubt, all that sadness, and all those things. So I don't know how... Y'all realize how important it is for us to praise God. Even if we can't sing, just praise God. It says meditate upon the Lord. Amen? Amen. I know that med the word meditation has a different meaning today. But what it means is our whole thoughts, our whole thinking, our whole mind should be on God. Amen? And He will take us to this level that it's supernatural. Amen. I can't explain it, but it's supernatural. And He will remove doubt. He will build your faith up. And you will be blessed. Amen. Those are the announcements I have. Um, I have more invitation cards um, in the car. And I can give you some of those if y'all want to invite people to, to come to the service. Amen. Uh, Brother Tay was telling me this morning that... Uh, when we're wanting, when we're excited about coming uh, to church on the Sabbath or keeping the Sabbath holy, he, he's telling me that uh, we get attacked more, right? <coughs> and it's true. The devil will attack you because he don't want you to praise the Creator of all creation, Abba Father, right? So let us praise God. Um, my wife has the sheets right there. Or Vanessa, if you can pass those sheets to yourselves. And then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start our praise and worship. And we'll lift our hands up. We'll praise God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence. Lord, we ask that you come into our hearts. Remove anything that's in our hearts that is distracting us, remove anything from our hearts that is causing a barrier between us and you to praise you 
and to learn from you, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and help everybody here that's going through something, Lord. Be with every person, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit and we rebuke the enemy. We rebuke all his demons that they be gone from this place and that we may concentrate on what you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, everybody. How's everyone doing? Amen. Happy Sabbath. At this time, um, I'm going to have my daughter Vanessa pick up tithes and offerings. And uh, if you have something to give, that's great. If you don't, it's okay as well. God is awesome. Amen. He has given us another day of life. Amen. He has woken you up this morning and has given you a uh, breath in your, in, your, in your lungs to live and to come praise God. Amen. Not many people woke up this morning. And um, we never know. We never know what could happen to us, right, from one day to the next. So we always have to be in that path, in that walk with the Lord. Let us pray for the money. Heavenly Father, we thank you, and we give our hearts to you, Lord, this morning. And we just want to thank you for, for the, the um, blessings. We want to thank you for, um, for everything that you do for us, Lord, and we ask a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in the news, a lot of stuff going on around the world, amen? But there's always been things going on around the world. Since the beginning of create, or after the fall of man, right? After the fall of man, things have been going downhill and they will continue to go downhill. I'm not saying this to be in a negative attitude, but things will continue to go in a downhill spiral. Not because God wants it to be that way. It's because we bring it upon ourselves. There's always been wars. There's always been um, famines. There's always been pestilences. There's always been corruption. There's always been evil. There's always been murders. There's always been these things that we see here today. The, the only difference is that it's in more intensity. It is more Severe. It is more powerful, right? So things are winding down, right? There's a lot of things going on. We know there's a war going on right now. And um, a lot of us, we become very patriotic, right? And it's okay to be patriotic, but who should we be more patriotic towards? It's Jesus Christ, right? That is God because... Do you think that uh, somebody in the Middle East is least important than us here in the United States? God loves them just as much as He loves us. Amen? He wants to save as many people as He can. Amen? So, in these last days, we have to keep our eyes focused on God, regardless of what's going on around us. Amen? Yes, we are to... Uh, we are, we are to be happy that we are uh, U.S. citizens, that we're Americans. I'm proud to be American. But my first, my first, uh, how do I say, my first dedication, my first, all my, my, my dedication in my heart goes to God. Amen? Because there's going to be things happening here around the world, and a lot of people are, are scared. A lot of people are scared. And we should be scared too if we don't have a relationship with God, right? If we don't have a relationship with God, we should be scared too. Because we don't know what could happen, right? So we have to be connected with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as I present this message to you, as I present this um, sermon titled, Come Out of Babylon, Lord, give me the words to say. And that it may be you that I speak to, to all of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and uh, play this video.
as um, we prepare this video, is a short introduction to my sermon. Thank you. of Bible prophecy have long been shrouded in mystery. Ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery, all depicting awesome apocalyptic events soon to come. Is it really possible to understand what they mean? What is the mark of the beast? Is it, as some say, a computer chip implanted under the skin, or even something more insidious? And what about the Antichrist? Has this sinister enemy of God already made his appearance? Or is he still waiting in the shadows? Will some terrorist of that trigger Earth's final tribulation? Will we witness the horrors of Armageddon and the seven last plagues? What do we need to know to avoid being left behind when the Lord returns? Will we recognize the last days and know what to expect? What you're about to experience will reveal what the Bible really says about Earth's end time events. Join me now as we uncover the amazing facts behind the final events of Bible prophecy. Amen. That's a short introduction of what the Bible covers and what it talks about. Amen. The message is called, Come Out of Babylon. What do you mean, uh, Pastor Juan, come out of Babylon? Isn't Babylon in the, in the Middle East or across the world? You know, the Bible talks a lot about Babylon. And a lot of us don't understand what is referring to in the book of Revelation, right? You know, we stop and think about it. If we stop and think about it, a lot of people are afraid to read the book of Revelation. And a lot of people, a lot of Christian people, a lot of pastors, a lot of churches will tell you don't even read the book of Revelation. Because they believe that we will be raptured 
before the book of Revelation takes place. So that's why they say don't worry about it. That's for the people that are left behind. But we all know that there's no rapture. There is no rapture. There's only the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we all go through the tribulation. As you saw in this short video, we're all going to go through the tribulation. But are we ready? Is our hearts ready? Are we dedicated in the ways of the Lord? Amen? The Bible tells us we need to come out of Babylon. In the last days, we need to come out of Babylon. Do we live in Babylon? We live in the United States, right? So you might be saying, is this message for me? Does it even relate to me? But if God warns us, if God warns you, I know as parents, we tell our children, be careful with this, right? Or be careful with that. Or be careful when you go over here. Or if you're uh, trying to get your driver's license, be careful with this. This happens, right? We always give warnings. Why do we give warnings to people? Because we love them, right? We give warnings to people because we don't want nothing to happen to them. We don't want anything bad to happen to them or even possibly lose their life, right? So the reason God gives us this warnings it's because He loves us. So He tells us, My people come out of Babylon. My people come out of Babylon. Leave Babylon. If God is telling us to leave Babylon, then we need to find out what Babylon is, right? And we will find out as we study on. But let's go to the first uh, verse that I have here. And it's in the book of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 10. And it says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, to every nation, what did I say? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give Him glory, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made the heaven and the earth, and the sea and the springs of water. And then another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Here, God is sending three angels in the last days. Three angels with three messages, right? And they're messages of warning. Get out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon. You don't want to receive her plagues. You don't want to receive the plagues. God has some uh, plagues reserved for the people that choose to remain in Babylon in the last days. I don't know, I don't know about y'all, but have y'all studied the plagues that fell in Egypt? Right? There was ten plagues that fell in Egypt because they went against God, right? You know that God is our Heavenly Father, right? We have our Heavenly Father and He loves you so much. And he puts up with a lot. God puts up with a lot. But when he sees his people being mistreated over and over, when he sees his Christian people being mistreated in the workplace or with family or in the world, right? God, God allows it. God allows it. God allows it. But then, just like any parent, okay, enough is enough. And that's why... God punishes as well. 
And he, remember in Egypt, he had the ten plagues fall, right? Well, the same thing in the last days. People have been, God's people have been attacked and attacked and attacked. God's real Christians have been attacked and attacked. And God is going to come to a point where He's, he's going to say, enough is enough. I've already given you the opportunity to change your ways. I've given you the opportunity to follow me. And he's talking to about the, the religious people, the, 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 the pastors and the churches. I've given you plenty of opportunities to stop following tradition and start following me. Amen? And you have not listened to me. And you have attacked my true Christians, my real people. Therefore, the seven last plagues will fall on you. I don't know about you, but we don't want to receive those seven last plagues, right? I know I don't. It's crazy. Let's read verse 8 again. And another, this is the second angel. And another angel follows saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The Bible always compares fornication when we disobey God. Yes, fornication is sleeping around. That's sin. But it also compares it when we go against God. When we break God's law. When we go against God and we're not obedient. God calls that fornication. Why? Because we are the bride of Jesus. Amen? We're the bride of Jesus so if I'm the wife of somebody and I decide to go cheat on my husband, what am I doing? I'm committing fornication, right? So when we're the bride of Jesus and we decide to go sin and we decide to go on the enemy of the, of the, on the, on the territory of the enemy of the devil, guess what we're doing? We're cheating on Jesus. We're committing fornication, right? So it's talking about this system of Babylon has committed fornications with the kings of the world, right? So this system is big time sinful and is big time connected with all kinds of high authorities, high powers and high governments, not just in the United States, but around the world. It says that she has made everyone drunk. When we are drunk, we become another person. I don't care what you want to tell me, that I can handle alcohol, or that I can drive better. I've heard all of it. I mean, I've even said it myself when I used to drink. We become another person. Our, our eyes are open to, to, to temptation even more, right? And uh, so it says that this system of Babylon has made everyone drunk. And it calls her a woman. I'll get to that point here in a minute. It says she has made everyone drunk. So a person can become more, what is it, more, if, they, if you encourage a drunk person to do something, they're most likely to do it, mm -hmm. right? So, and we make dumb decisions in life. When we're drunk, we make dumb decisions in life. We do some crazy things, right? Uh, we either become foolish or we go do some crazy things, right? Um, so this system has made um, everyone drunk. I'm trying to find the word. I can't think. Uh, vulnerable. Ver vulnerable. I can't say that word. Vulnerable. <laughs> vulnerable. Vulnerable. And uh, <laughs> but uh, so. All these systems around the world, this system is using them. And fornication, right? When you sleep with somebody, it says that we take something from that person. You're connected to that person in one way or another. That's why God said he intended for marriage to be between one woman and one man, right? Not with other people. Because when you have sexual relationships with another person, you take part of them. That's why when we get married, sex comes after marriage, right? Because that makes you one with that person. 
So when you're having sexual relationship with somebody that you're not married to, you're taking that oneness and you're you're robbing that from them, right? And that's why it's important for us to rebuke that and repent from that and ask God to remove that from us, that curse. But that's what this system has done. She has committed fornications with all the systems around the world. And that's why she's connected. She's connected with all the systems around the world. Let's read Revelation chapter 18, verse 3 through 5. The reading the book of Revelation is a blessing. It's not for us to ignore. Because if we're in the last days, we should be reading it, right? Because this message is for us. Revelation chapter 18. 3 all the way to verse 5. And it says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, unless you share in her sins, unless you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven. God has remembered her iniquities. Right? Basically what we were just talking about. It says, come out of Babylon, my people. You don't want to be caught up with her sins. Don't stay in that relationship with her. Stop messing around with her. Right? And get to your true love. It's Jesus Christ, right? Get to your true love, which is Jesus Christ. Come out of her, my people. God is calling us out of what? What is Babylon? I'll get to that here in a minute. What is Babylon? What are those plagues that we might get if we don't get out? What are those plagues that we might get if we don't get out? Well, let's go back into history, way back in the Old Testament, because Revelation is the last book of the Bible, right? But let's go all the way back to the book of what? What's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. If we want to know what Babylon is, if we want to know what God is calling us out of, and God is calling us out of Babylon, then we need to know what Babylon is, right? Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. The first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 11 verse 1. Now the whole, the whole earth had one language and one speech. What does the Bible tell us here? That the whole world only spoke one language and one speech. Right? Right? Let's go to um, verse 3 all the way to verse 4. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks, bake them thoroughly, that they had bricks for stone and that they had asphalt for mortar, mortar, mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower, whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth hmm. these people said let's build a tower all the way to heaven let's make a tower all the way to heaven and you know what men are smart I mean if we stop and think about all the technology that we have today we are smart God gave us his brains to use right mm -hmm. but sometimes we use our our Wisdom and how smart we are for evil instead of for good things, right? So they were building this tower. It was passing the clouds. It was going all the way. I mean, it was going all the way up into space almost. It was a very big tower that they were building. You know, this is um, this reminds me of what uh, Christianity is about sometimes. We want to serve God the way we want to serve God, right? Not the way God tells us. Amen? This is their attempt 
to go to heaven. This is man's way to go to heaven. And God says, no, you need me. God's saying, you need me, not your own way. And that's what we try to do today. Well, I'm just going to be a good person and I'll go to heaven. I'm just going to uh, give a big donation to, uh, to uh, some you know, benefit place and I'll go to heaven. You have rich people thinking this. Did you know you have famous people thinking this? They give thousands of dollars, even uh, millions of dollars to a lot of people and, and a lot of uh, charities and stuff thinking that's going to get them to heaven. And I'm not saying that it's, we shouldn't give, but they think just doing those things is going to earn them going to heaven. And they're mistaken. We need Jesus Christ. Amen? We need Jesus Christ. We cannot work ourselves to heaven. Amen? We need Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's what they were trying to do. The other thing is, too, is they remembered the story of the flood. The flood had happened back then and they were like well just in case God decides to get mad at us again and flood this whole earth we can be on this tower and it'll be all the way up into heaven so this is men not trusting God what God tells us we should trust him amen why do we doubt we see miracle and miracle after miracle and we still doubt they saw miracles back then, and they still doubt it. And that's why they build this tower. Let's continue to read 5 through 9. Genesis 11, 5 through 9. But the Lord came down to, the, to see the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will with help from them. Come let us go down there and confuse their language and that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad the, there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. There's three, kill, uh, three points that I need to bring out right here. The first one is, they were called the sons of man. Sometimes you read the sons of God, that's referring to God's people, right? The sons, not the son of God, but the sons of God. When the Bible says the sons of God or the men of God, is referring to people of God. Here is calling them the sons of men. Meaning these people didn't have a relationship with God. That's the first thing I want to bring out. The second thing I want to bring out. God said if we didn't stop them. If we didn't change their languages. They probably would have got all the way up to heaven. You know what I mean? Man comes up with, I mean, do we not go to space today? We do some crazy things, right? Our wisdom, and you got to stop and think about it. I was talking to Brother Rick this morning. Back then, people were a lot smarter than we are today. Why? Because they were closer to creation. But with time, we started to degenerate. We used to be up to nine feet tall. Actually, 16. Actually, 16. Exodus 16? No, actually 16 feet tall. 16 feet tall. Yeah. And then um, the Bible records of people living up to 900 years, up to 1,000 years. People were living a long time. So they were closer to creation back then. So they used their wisdom. They used their knowledge to build these pyramids and all the things that we see and that we have discovered. But also... They used it for evil instead of good. Amen. So God had to confuse their language. God had to change everyone's languages and give them different languages to speak. 
Therefore, they had to stop building this tower in this city. And they were scattered. But the third thing I want to point out here. It says, therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused their language. Amen. This is the origin of the word Babylon. This is where we get the first word that uh, it originated from. The word Babylon originated from the word Babel, which means confusion. Okay? So let us not forget where the word Babylon first originated from. It's called Babel, and then if you continue to read in your own time, the, the place called Babel eventually turned into Babylon. So it was a literal place over there in the Middle East called Babylon. But is God calling us out of that place? That place is in ruins right now. It's not even a city. It's more of a historical site now. So if we're reading the book of Revelation, it's, calling, it's telling us come out of Babylon. There's, no, there's nothing going on over there right now. So why would God be calling us out of that literal place of Babylon? Let us continue to read, right? Let us continue to read. So many years later, Babylon would be formed from that place called Babel. It was a pagan city that worshipped many false gods. You know what Babylon, the city of Babylon really was? The city of Babylon was copying the city of Jerusalem. Because God had his people build the city of Jerusalem. That was their city. That God, it was a gift for God's people. Right? So Babylon, you know that the devil tries to copy everything that is true? The devil tries to copy. Right? We have the Sabbath. The devil has Sunday sacred, sacredness. Right? We have, uh, we have the truth of what, about what happens when we die. It's not until after the rest of the, when Jesus comes back that we go to heaven. The devil comes up with that. No, right when you die, you go to heaven. Right? The devil always has his substitute. He copies what God has. Because the devil wants praise and worship towards him. He doesn't want us to praise the true God. Amen? And that's what the devil continues to do up till this day. But that's what Babylon was a city built for their pagan gods. Babylon was copying what Jerusalem had. But they worshiped false gods in, in the city of Babylon. Right? <clears throat> Many, uh, they worship many gods and they attack Jerusalem, God's people. When they attack Jerusalem and destroy Jerusalem, they took many of God's people captives. One of those guys was Daniel. And then you had the other two uh, Jewish, the, the other two Hebrew guys. They would, take, uh, they would take people as captives to work in the city of Babylon. But even though they were captives there, they remained faithful. They remained faithful and they stood up for God no matter what. Amen? So Babylon means confusion. Babylon means false religion. Babylon means pride. That's what Babylon means. It's symbolic. A lot of the stuff in the book of Revelation is symbolic. It's not literal. We got to be careful on what God is telling us is literal and what is symbolic. Because like I said right now, the city of Babylon is in ruins. It's a historical place now. So if God is telling us to come out of Babylon in these last days, is he telling us to come out of that place over there? No. So what he's referring to as Babylon is False Christianity. False walk with God. False religion. Amen? 
That's what God is referring to as Babylon. So if God is telling us in these last days to come out of Babylon, God is telling us to come out of false systems, right? False systems that are tied with all these systems around the world, with all the governments around the world. We're watching uh, the, movie, the Christian movie Ben-Hur, and um, it shows the Romans. The Romans marching in, and they're coming in, right? And guess what symbol they have they're holding up? They're holding an eagle. The same symbol that the Egyptians had. The same symbol that the United States has. And I'm not saying that the United States is bad. I'm saying is that this system, this pagan system of Babylon and false worship is tied with all the governments of the world, including the United States. I'm happy to be American. I'm proud to be American. But the Bible says there's a second beast coming out, which will make an image to the first beast. And it says it will practice everything that this Antichrist system is doing. And it's going to enforce the mark of the beast. That's why it says the third angel's message that Babylon will enforce the mark of the beast. We don't want to be part of this system, right? The Jewish people were God's people and were in Babylon for 70 years. How many of you, how many of you um, are from another city besides Amarillo? All right. How long ago were you there? 10 years? All right. So if you, weren't ra if you weren't raised here and you lived in another city, you were used to the, those ways, right? But after you've been in Amarillo or where, whatever city you moved to and you've been there a long time, say you've been there five years, you get used to the, to the ways of Amarillo, right? You get to the, used to their uh, culture, you know where the best taco trucks are at. <laughs> You know where to go uh, hang out at? You know the best places to buy a house at? The better areas of town, right? Uh, you get used to all the ways, right? You know, uh, Amarillo is more of a Hispanic city, right? You know, uh, there's, you know, you get used to all the different cultures and different things. When you've been somewhere more than five years, you start to adapt. You start to kind of adapt and kind of blend in, right? Because you, you start to learn their ways. Here in Texas, we call all the sodas, we call them Cokes, right? Even if it's a Dr. Pepper or a Sprite, we call them Cokes. But you go up north, they call them soda pops. So it's different everywhere we go. But wherever you're at, more than five years, you start to get used to it. You start to get used to it and you start to adapt. Well, God's people... We're in the city of Babylon, and they started learning their ways. They started learning their ways, right? But let me, uh, but let me tell you a quick story about Lot. How many of y'all know the story of Lot? Lot and his wife. But before we get to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, did you know Lot and his uncle Abraham? They went up before the city because they couldn't get along. Well, it, was, it was mostly Lot kind of rebelling against Abraham. They couldn't get along, so they decided to go their separate ways. And um, they said, okay, uh, let's look out on the fields. Where do you want to live, Lot? And then Lot asked Abraham, where do you want to live? Abraham always prayed before he made a decision. That's why we all, as Christians, we always got to pray before we make a major decision. Whether we're going to buy a house, whether we're going to move, what schools our kids are going to go to, what car we're going to buy. When it comes to major decisions, we should always pray, right? Abraham prayed. But Lot saw the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, wow, Las Vegas, that looks nice. Those lights look nice at night, right? And he goes, I think I'll, 
take my family in that direction. I'll move my family to the city of Las Vegas or the city of New Orleans. I'll move my, my family to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. It looks attractive, right? So he moves his family there. They, make, they, they go their separate ways. And Lot is a man of God, right? Lot is a man of God. So is his wife. They move there. They build a life. They buy their house. They, uh, they buy their car, and they have daughters. They have many daughters. I don't know if the Bible ever mentions sons. I think they only have daughters. And they're, they're living their life there. But how many of y'all know if you read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, there were two cities so sinful that God said, Okay, I've had enough. I have to destroy these two cities. And I'm going to make fire come out of heaven and destroy these two cities. Right? But see, the problem is here is that sometimes we want to play with sin. We want to play with fire and see how much we can handle the fire without getting burnt. Right? And the mistake that Lot did here was he wanted to live as a... As a, a a man of God in a sinful place, in a very sinful place. And sometimes, I mean, I hear today, I hear a lot today, um, I'm a Christian and I need to reach people in the bar, right? Or I need to reach people in the club. And they go there and they sit down next to the other person. And they're drinking a beer too, and they're drinking a beer, and they're sharing about God to them. You think they're taking you seriously? No. Even if you go there with the intentions of not wanting to drink, eventually you're going to start drinking. Eventually you're going to start sharing the jokes that they're sharing, the dirty jokes. Or the gossip, right? You're not going to reach them, they're going to reach you. That's why the Bible says um, to abstain from all forms of evil, right? Yes, we are to go minister to people. But to, for us to stay there and make it a weekly habit of going to the bars or going to the clubs, we're in dangerous grounds. We're now in the playground of the devil. Amen? And that's what Lot did. These cities were so bad. I mean, so bad that... Whatever you wanted to do, you, you could do. Perversion was so bad. I mean, it, I, I don't want to go into detail. But the Bible tells us what these two cities were so bad about. And it was mostly about perversion, homosexuality. Uh, uh, I don't even want to say that name, but with animals. I mean, all kinds of crazy things. Everything went... And in the process, in the process, he lost his wife and he lost a few of his daughters. Because he thought he could raise a godly family in the sinful area, right? And it says that when the angels came and told Lot, go tell your daughters, go tell the people you know, there's fire going to come down. Go tell them they need to leave. And he went up and told some of his daughters, y'all need to come with me. You know, God's about to destroy this place with fire. And they were making fun of his. His own daughters were making fun of him and saying, you're drunk. I think you're drunk. You're speaking craziness. <laughs> right? And then when they escaped... And, the, and the, the angels took Lot and his wife and some of his daughters. They were running out of the city of Babylon. God told them, don't look back. Don't look back. You will be destroyed if you look back. You know, when God tells us something, there's a reason why he tells us something. He don't just tell us just to see, oh, let me play this game with uh, Brother Tate or with Leanne or Vanessa or Brother Rick. 
Let me play this game with them and see if they obey me. No. There's a reason why God tells us these things. It's because He knows better, right? He knows you. He knows me better than we know ourselves, right? So He was telling us, don't look. He was telling them, don't look back. Because they were escaping. They were coming out of Babylon. I'm sorry. They're coming out of Lot, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his wife and his daughters. They were come, coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And fire was already coming down. And then it says that Lot's wife looks back. And as soon as she looks back, she becomes a pillar of salt. Right? And it's sad that her husband... And his daughters had to keep moving forward. I'm sure he was crying. I'm sure he was devastated. He goes, I just lost my wife. And I lost a few of my daughters back in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, we might be out of Babylon. Because Babylon represents false systems, false Christianity. We might be... We might not be tied to some of these churches that are teaching error, right? We might be out of uh, a lot of these churches that are going against the Ten Commandments of God or that are not teaching the Sabbath. We might be out of these churches, but it's Babylon in your heart. And that's what happened with uh, Lot's wife. Even though she came out of the city, the sinful city, she still desired all the sin that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. She still missed all that. Like, I'm going to live in the hills? I'm, living the, I'm going to take off and leave the city to go live in the hills? I'm used to what I had back there. Right? I don't, I don't want to miss that. Babylon was still in her heart. Sodom and Gomorrah was still in her heart. Sin was still in her heart. So you might not be in these false churches today. You might not be in these uh, false religions. You might not be in all these false churches that are set up today around the world. But you could still have Babylon in your heart. You still might have those traditions of certain churches that are keeping you from moving forward, right? So a lot of us were either raised Catholic, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah Witness, Mormons, Buddhists. There, I mean, the list goes on and on. And sometimes, even though God removes us from a lot of these churches, we still have that pride and want to hold on to those things. Well, that's the way the church has always done it. Are we still holding on to the traditions? Even though God is calling us to move forward, yes, a lot of these churches serve their purpose at one time. You know uh, the story of Martin Luther, the German guy, the reformer. During that time, there was only one religion, and that was the Catholic Church. At that time, there was only one religion. When Martin Luther decided to protest against the Catholic Church and say, what the church is teaching doesn't line up with what the Bible says. Amen? What the church is teaching doesn't go with what the Bible says. Amen? And he caused a reformation. He caused people to open their eyes and, and start reading the word, the Bible. And like, oh, yeah, you know, we're not supposed to pray to saints. It's God's grace that we need, right? It's not our own works. We shouldn't pay for people to, to come out of purgatory. Where's that in the Bible, right? And we should do the same. I don't care what church you're at, whether it's a denomination or it's not, whether it's non-denominational, whether it's Seventh-day Adventist, whether it's Baptist, Pentecostal, Catholic, I don't care what church you're at. If it's not in the Bible, and they're teaching you that? Who are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to follow God? Or are you going to choose to follow the traditions of the church? Now, if they're teaching you truth, follow that truth. 
But if they're teaching you something that is not in the Word of God in the Bible, be careful. That's Babylon. Be careful. That is traditions of man rather than the commandments of God. Amen? We are to follow God continually. We are to follow God whatever He reveals to us. You know that we continue to learn. You know what's the problem with making a denomination? When we make a denomination, I don't care what de denomination it is. When you make a denomination, they say, okay, this is what God has revealed to us. This is all the truths. Anything outside of these doctrines or these truths, we don't accept it. I'm going to step out in faith and say something. I'm going to step out in faith and say something. I was studying to be a pastor for the CERN denomination. I was already going to college. It was a four-year term. And I had, I had people supporting me in the church. They were helping me pay to be a pastor. They were excited for me to be a pastor for this denomination. All right? But then I was feeling conviction. I was talking to my wife and I was like, I know that the Bible says this, but this church teaches this. Why am I, once I become a pastor for this denomination, am I able to be able to preach all the truth or am I going to have to just teach what they want me to teach? Amen? And I ain't going to lie, this denomination has 95% of all the truth that's found in the Bible. But there's that 5% that are made up things that have nothing to do with the Bible. And, I, and my wife told me, are you going to be able to live with yourself once you have this, uh, your own church and you're making good money because they pay you good? Are you going to be able to live with yourself, not be able to preach the whole truth to your congregation? And then I remember the Bible verses that says that preachers are held more accountable than the average person. Why? Because we're pastors, we're leading people to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. How am I going to be able to teach you 95% of the truth and hold back the other 5%? No, we are to preach whatever God has called us to preach. We are to share with people all the truth, the whole truth, right? Because if I hold back from you that 5%, I will be lost. And possibly you could be lost because I may be leading you astray, right? Right? So we removed ourselves from, the, from this denomination. I stopped going to be this pastor for this denomination. And it was, it was crazy. People started calling us and almost like we committed this biggest sin in the world. Our relationship with God didn't stop. We continue to serve the Lord. Amen? We continue to serve the Lord. And then I get a call. I get a call and says, you know what? Because uh, at that time I was an elder. Elder one, you don't even have to go to college for four years. We have a church for you right now. And you can be a pastor right now. Isn't that crazy? If it was somebody else, oh man, they would have jumped right on it. I, get, I don't have to go to college for four years and I can be a pastor right now and I can have my own church. Somebody would have jumped on it, right? Why? Because their mind is on the money, not on the message of God. Amen? So I was willing to sacrifice all that because I want to preach the truth, even if there's five people here. Right? I want to lead people to the truth of God. And we have to come out of Babylon. All these denominations have served as a purpose throughout their lives. You know, when the Baptists, you know, the, I can't remember who was the reformer for the Baptist church, when they protested against the Catholic church and they learned the truth of the right way to be baptized, 
That's great. That's why they call themselves Baptists, right? When the Pentecostal noticed that we should be joyful and we should be happy serving the Lord rather than coming to church all gloomy and sad and, and I mean, just following traditions, sit down, stand up, kneel down, stand up. I mean, do exercises, <laughs> right? No, the Pentecostal is like, no, we, we are to be excited. This is the greatest joy. This is the good news, right? So they discover the truth about that. And then you have the Assemblies of God. You have the Jehovah Witness. The Jehovah Witness says, the Bible, they're practicing what the Bible says in regards to going door to door. That's what we should be doing. It says going twos door to door. That's why they do that. So they learned that from the Bible, so that's what they're doing. Then you have the Seventh-day Adventists and say, hold up, we've been serving God, on, we've been, uh, we've been uh, keeping Sunday holy, but the Bible says the seventh day, right? They discovered the truth about the Sabbath. And it continues and continues. The thing is that we stop. We stop because God is revealing truth to us. And we stop at whatever church we feel comfortable with, right? And say, well, I'm going to be a Baptist all my life no matter what. I'm going to be Pentecostal all my life no matter what. I'm going to be Seventh-day Adventist all my life no matter what. I'm going to be Catholic. I'm going to be Jehovah's Witness. No matter what you tell me, that's what I'm going to be. Is that, our, is that what our attitude should be? No. What is God calling you to preach? God is continually revealing things to us. Amen? As long as from the Word of God, as long as it's in the Bible. The Bible says, praise God with all instruments. Right? Now, we got to be careful how we're praising God. And how does the music sound? It shouldn't be distorted. It should be clear. The, the Word should be clear, right? Amen. So, we are to praise God even with drums. Amen? But certain churches today say no. Are we going to listen to what the church tells us or are we going to listen to what the Bible tells us? Right? And the list goes on and on. God is saying, come out of Babylon because they're making it about themselves rather than about God. Amen? If you stop and think about it, my friends, we are the church. The people are the church. Amen? The Bible says that um, the remnant is those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen? What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? The spirit of prophecy. Right? The spirit of prophecy is not just tied to one prophet. The spirit of prophecy is the prophecies in the book of Revelation. And the Bible says in the last days, young women and old men will have visions and will prophesy. So we can't be stuck on one prophet. We can't be stuck on one prophet. And that's what a lot of churches do today. I'm not saying that this certain prophet is a false prophet. I'm just saying the spirit of prophecy is all prophecy. Not just one prophet. Right? And it says those that keep the commandments of God. What are the commandments of God? Y'all should, everybody should know the commandments of God, right? The Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment for us to keep the Sabbath holy. So, we are to follow God. We make the church, true believers around the world, no matter what church you're going to, or even if you're worshiping at home, if you're keeping the commandments of God and you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, you are that remnant. You have come out of Babylon. As long as you're faithful to God, and you want to know what church is false and which is true, are they teaching the Ten Commandments? Simple as that. With just that, you eliminate 99% of all the churches around the world. 
That's why God gave us his holy law, the Ten Commandments. You want to know if this church is false? Are they teaching the Ten Commandments? Or are they adding to the Bible? We've got to be careful, right? So what were those seven plagues that um, God says that he will give um, when we receive the mark when we receive the mark of the beast and then they attack God's people, God's going to say, okay, enough's enough. And he's going to give those people that are attacking God's people the seven last plagues. And I don't have time to go through it in the Bible, but these are the seven last plagues. It's actually found in the book of Revelation chapter 16. The first one is source. The second one is uh, the sea creatures die. Everything in the ocean dies. The third one is says the water turns to blood. Imagine you go and try to drink some water, you try to take a shower, and it comes out blood. If that happens, I'm sorry to say, but you're lost. There's no more second chance. You're lost. You've been sealed. You either have the mark of the beast or you have the seal of God. If you go and turn on the water or you try to drink water and it comes out blood, you're lost. That's the second plague. or the, Actually, that's the third plague. The fourth plague is um, the sun torches people. Have you ever been out here on a hot day in the summer, 105 degrees? It's gone up to 110 degrees, I think. Well, imagine God turning the sun to 150 degrees or maybe even hotter. You know, he does a lot of things. Well, you might say, well, I'll just stay inside. If he, if he was to turn the heat up to 160, what do you think is going to do to your air conditioning in the house? It's going to mess it up. It can't handle it. It's going to torture people with the sun. And then uh, plague number five, darkness. But this is that this plague is only for the beast and the false prophet. So these are all the systems. I don't know how he's going to do that, but he's going to turn it so dark that they're going to get paranoid and they're going to bite their own tongues. That's how dark it's going to be. Uh, number six, the river Euphrates dries up. That's a long story. You know how Babylon got destroyed? You had the river Euphrates going under the, the city of Babylon. And that's what gave that city power. It says that Babylon was so advanced that they had sewers. And they had... Uh, they had sewage system and everything. That's how smart they were. But they had a river that would run under the city. Because the, the city of Babylon had walls, thick walls around the whole city that no enemy could go through the walls of Babylon. It says the walls were so thick and so high that they could march, they could have uh, horses on chariots go around the top of a wall. Bigger than the walls that Donald Trump's trying to build, right? These were humongous walls and so thick, it was like a freeway around the, the city of Babylon. And they had the, the river going, the river Euphrates going under the city of Babylon. And, they, and that's how they were able to, you know, you need water, right? You need water to, to grow fruit, vegetables. You need water to bathe. You need water for everything. We need water for everything, right? If we don't have water, we're not going to survive. And you know what happened? Um, I can't remember who the king of Babylon was at that time. But he was laughing at God and saying, Nobody can ever overtake Babylon. Nobody can ever, and they got drunk. They got drunk, and this is that when they were all partying and getting drunk, it says this hand came out of nowhere. This hand came out of nowhere. Can you imagine we're all standing here, and this, this hand comes out in the air, 
right? <laughs> and then it just comes over here and starts writing on the wall. It wrote, it wrote something in Hebrew that meant your kingdom, something about your kingdom is now given to your enemies or something like that. Or your kingdom will be destroyed. Given to the meats. Given to the meats. And the king was like, what in the world is happening? And they're all drunk. I think they stopped getting drunk. I think they sobered up. <laughs> they sobered up. God was pronouncing a judgment on them. Saying Babylon's going to be destroyed. And remember, the king was laughing and saying, there's nobody can destroy the city. Look how thick our walls are. You know what, you know what uh, God allowed the enemies to do? Simple. Because they tried to destroy Babylon many times. They couldn't get past those walls. They were too thick and too high. You know what God allowed the enemies to do? The river Euphrates, if it would you know it would go under the city. He allowed the enemies to put a dam or block the water, the river, and go in a different direction. And it dried up the river Euphrates under the city of Babylon, because water gave Babylon life. And therefore, now you have a dry river, and all the all. The, the Babylonians, they were all partying that up and they were drunk. Can you fight when you're drunk? No. You think you can, but you can't. And therefore, the whole army, the enemies, were able to march underneath the city of Babylon through the dried up river, Euphrates. And they march under the city and come up into the city and they attack the, the Babylonians. And the Babylonians aren't able to fight back because they're all drunk. And therefore Babylon is destroyed. That's what happened. So it says that in the last days, God is going to dry up the river Euphrates. But just like we, we just read that the city, that the system of Babylon is symbolic, for false Christianity. And it's telling us that plague number six, he's going to dry up the river Euphrates. You know what he means by that? It's symbolic too. That God is going to remove all the support from all the systems around the world. This city of Babylon, it's symbolic in the New Testament. For the Vatican. For the papal system. But we got to remember she has daughters, right? And then the plague number seven. Plague number seven is right before the coming of Jesus. It says that a great earthquake so big that the, all the mountains fall down. There's got to be a big uh, earthquake, right? All the, all the mountains fall down, and it says huge hell. I can't remember what size, but it says almost the size of a car. Hell falling down. All this is happening right before Jesus comes down. So that's plague number seven. Let's read Revelation 17, verse 1. Then one of the angels who had the seven bows came and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. This is John, remember? He was one of the disciples that the Romans tried to kill, but no matter how much they tried to kill him, they even put boiling oil on him and he didn't die. He was a superhero, right? <laughs> But God did not allow him to die because the Romans were trying to kill him. They killed all the other disciples, but they couldn't kill John. So the Romans were so frustrated, they decided to cast John into an island. Well, he can die there of old age. You know, we'll take him on a boat. We'll drop him off there and we'll come back. He won't be able to come back. 
So John is sitting there, and God, that's why God preserved his life. Because John wrote the book of Revelation. John was writing about Rome and what Rome would become later on, right? So John goes into a vision and this angel comes and talks to John. He says, let me show you something. John, let me show you something. I'm going to show you the judgment of this great harlot who sits on many waters. I'm going to show you what's going to happen to this prostitute who sits on many waters. Now we read earlier, a prostitute is a woman or is a church that goes against the things of God. It doesn't necessarily mean sexual perversion. It means when we disobey God, we're committing fornication. So this church system will receive judgment. And her support system is the water. The Bible tells us that many waters represents a multitude of people. All right? So this, the, the, the people around the world support this church. But there's going to be judgment on her. Let's read Revelation 17, verse 4 and 5. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and prepared and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written. Check it out. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, or the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. That's why it was necessary for us to understand what Babylon represented in the Old Testament. But it says that this church system in the last days has on her forehead what? Babylon, the mother of prostitutes, the mother of harlots. If you're a mother, you have what? Children. Right? So this system of the Roman Catholic Church is the mother church. You don't believe me? Ask them themselves. They'll tell you we are the mother church. They'll tell you, what church do you go to? Oh, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm Seventh-day Adventist, I'm, I'm Baptist. You're our daughter. You, you left us. That happened with the Reformation. With Martin Luther, William Tyndall, John Huss, and all these reformers that decided to protest against the mother church. And said, we don't want nothing to do with you. They left the church with good intentions. They left the church with good intentions and said, we don't want nothing to do with you because you're teaching error. And they found new truths in the Bible. But today, they're back with the mother church. Today, almost every denomination and even non-denominational churches are back with the mother church. They're all united. You don't see what's going on around the world with the unity of all denominations and the unity of all Christianity? It's happening. She's called the mother church. It says she was adorned in purple and scarlet. You want to know what the colors of the mother church is? Purple and red. Every time you turn on what's going on in the Vatican, guess what colors are right there? Purple and red. Purple and red. Every single one of them dressed in purple and red. Straight out of the Bible, right there. And it says they hold in their hands a what? A golden cup. What do they do in their service every, every Sunday? Hold a, cup, a golden cup. Amen? But it goes even further. I'm not here to attack the system or this church. Because God is saying that the system is evil. It doesn't mean the people in it are evil. Because a lot of people just don't know, right? But it goes even further. It says that she's a mother. Therefore, she has daughters. 
The daughters are far off worse than the mother. You might say, I'm not part of this church. But you might be the daughter of this church, right? And you might say, well, I'm non-denominational. I don't, I don't attend any of these churches. But just like the wife of Lot, Lot's wife, she didn't have Babylon in her. I mean, she, she was out of Babylon, but she still had Babylon in her heart. You might not be part of any of these churches. You might not practice any of these teachings of sun, Sunday sacredness, or the secret rapture, or life after death, or all this foolishness, right? You might not believe all those things. But do you have Babylon in your heart? Are you still caught up in sin? Of course we're never going to be sinless. But when we're in Christ, we're washed away, right? We have to repent from our sin, amen? We need to repent of our sin, and that's the only way God can cleanse us. We have to admit that we're sinners. You know, uh, sometimes we have, to, we have to own up where we messed up in order to make it right. If we don't own up to it and we make excuses for it, and we use the excuse, well, everyone sins. Basically, what you're trying to say is that I'm going to continue to do what I want to do. Because everyone sins no matter what. No. Did you know that God perfects you day after day? The more you, the more you let go of your sinful, sinful habits or your sinful ways, the more you repent, the more you come to God, the more you surrender to Him, He's going to change you. He's going to change you. You're not going to be the same person you were a year ago. You're not going to be the same person you were a month ago. Because if you're allowing God to change you, He's going to change you. Right? You're still going to sin, but it's not going to be like it used to be. It's not going to be like it used to be. You're going to be a new creation. The Bible says your old ways are crucified, right? And you become a new creation. If you restore a car, you know, you get a car and uh, it's plain, plain Jane, right? And you add some rims, you tint the windows, you put a nice stereo system, you screens. nice paint job. With screens. Some screens, <laughs> whatever you want to put on it, right? You make it look nice. It looks different, right? That's what God wants to do with you. He wants to make you a new creation. But for us to share with others, not for us to keep it to ourselves. Amen? He wants to make you a new creation. He wants you to come out of Babylon, whether it's these denominations or these non-denominational churches, or their systems and their ways, or our sinful ways. God wants us to come out of Babylon. Amen? God wants us to come out of Babylon. Out of these false beliefs, a lot of times we come up with so many traditions. You know, like in the Mexican, in us as Mexicans, we have traditions. We have quinceaneras. We have, we have, uh, we have certain things that we do throughout, you know, our lives, throughout the year. The question is, we got to ask ourselves: Is the tradition that I'm doing as Hispanic? Is it going against God? Or is it okay with God? Right? For black people, African Americans, y'all have certain cultures, certain traditions. For Caucasian people, y'all have certain cultures, certain traditions, right? You gotta ask yourself, the culture and tradition that I'm doing, does it go against God? Because if it does, I need to stop doing it. Right? If it doesn't go against God, then it's okay for me to continue to do it. Simple as that. That's what we got to ask ourselves. And the same thing, whatever church we're going to, whatever they teach you that's truth, hold on to that. Whatever they're teaching you that is not truth, throw it out. Actually expose it, right? That's what Martin Luther did. He exposed evil, right? Right? The Bible says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, has become a habitation of devils. 
this system of Babylon is religions and denominations and non-denominational churches that have made it about themselves. They have made churches about a business. They have made churches about, it's a business, it's what it is. And it's not about leading people to Christ anymore. You know, I tell people, yes, I invite people to come to church. I mean, who doesn't want people to come to their church, right? But most importantly, we should try to lead people to Christ first, right? You know, uh, we are to lead people to Christ first. Because their salvation is more important rather than trying to make them part of our church. Because we get prideful. I'm from the Christian Lighthouse Church. What church do you go to? (laughs) I'm from, I'm a crip. Are you a blood? Or I go to this high school and I go to Amarillo High. What school do you go to? You know, we, we, we become prideful, right? I'm SDA, or I'm Baptist, or I'm Pentecostal. What church do you go to? Or I go to the Door Church, or I go to this church, or I go to that church. We become prideful. It's not about our church. It's about the truth that we're teaching. Are we leading people to Christ? You know what, everything that's going on around us, there's going to come a day, there's going to come a day where we won't be able to meet in the church. We won't be able to meet in the church. Does that mean that you're still not the church? If you're following God's truth, you are God's church. Amen? So you continue to hold on and follow what God has for us. Read the Bible. The Bible is not being preached in the churches anymore. The Bible is not being presented in the churches anymore. It's not even encouraged for you to bring the Bible to church. People sit in the church they don't have a Bible with them. Or they might say it to themselves, I don't know how to read the Bible. Well, you got to start somewhere. Right? Write the Bible verses. Look them up at home. Right? But we must go to the Word of God. We must go to the Bible and come out of Babylon. Jesus says, forsake the worldly things and confusion. His way is better. His way is better than ours. Amen? Let's go to the book of Ezekiel 36, 26. The book of Ezekiel 36, 26. It says, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He will remove our stubbornness our pride, our bitterness, our anger, our jealousy, our uh, all those things that separate us from God, that makes our heart hard, like a rock, right? And he says he will give us a heart of flesh. He's going to soften our hearts. But in order for that to happen, we have to allow God to do that in us, right? It's not just going to happen. You can try to do it on your own. God says, stop stop trying to do it on your own. Come to me. Give me your heart. And I'm going to make that heart soft. You're going to become a big teddy bear, right? You can be the hardest gangster or hardcore or you've had a rough life. You were raised in the streets. A lot of those things, you've had a rough raising in your life. Maybe you were homeless. Maybe you went through a lot of things and that made you that made you who you are today, right? Or you were mistreated by your parents or whatever, right? That made you angry. Or that made you hate people. Or that made you hardcore or whatever. And you're trying to change on your own. You're trying to become a better person. God says, stop trying to do that. Bring your heart to me. Give me your heart. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will soften your heart. You'll become a loving person. You'll become a happy person. And you'll become a cheerful person. Amen? 
you'll become a big teddy bear. That's what you'll become. So us men, we need to stop trying to be hardcore, right? And start trying to intimidate people because of how we were raised or because of the things we've been through. I know some people have gone through worse things than others. It doesn't matter because when we come to Christ, He wants us to make us into a new creation. Amen? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. As long as you remain in the walk of Christ, you're sealed. As long as you stay in the path of God, you're sealed. If you were to die, you will be saved. If... Uh, if bad things start happening around you and you continue to stay in the path of God, you will praise God in the good and in the bad. Right? If, the, if your whole church has turned their back against you, and it hurts, as long as you're in the, in the path of God, you will be saved. Continue to stay in the path of God and you become a new creation. Amen? The Bible tells us that when, we, that when we are forgiven of our sins, that our sins are cast into the bottom of the ocean. Scientists tell us that there's places that they cannot find the bottom of the ocean. Scientists tell us that no matter how deep they try to go with these instruments into the bottom of the ocean, they can only go so far in the ocean because the, it'll crush It'll crush the, 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 that submarine that they're trying to go all the way to the bottom of the ocean. It says that your oxygen and then all that can't handle it going too deep into the ocean. So if our sins are cast into the bottom of the ocean, it's because God is, is he has forgiven you. And sometimes you ask yourself, has God really forgiven me? Has God really forgiven me? If God says He forgives you, He really forgives you. So why are you trying to go fishing again? Why are you trying to go fishing and, re and bring those sins back on the way you used to be? If you're in the path of God, you are saved. Stop doubting. I hear a lot of people say, well, hopefully when God comes, I'll go to heaven. <laughs> Or hopefully when I die, I'll be saved. What do you mean hopefully? You should know whether you're saved or not. If you're daily walking with the Lord, and you're daily repenting, and you're asking God to, to change you, and you're daily surrendering to Him, you will be saved. That is confidence that God wants us to have. Amen? He says... Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what does it mean if anyone's in Christ? He is a new creation. As long as we remain in Christ in our everyday walk with Him, we're a new creation. And He's going to continue to change you. And when people come to you, they're going to be like, there's something different about you. They're going to see Christ in you. Amen? We go through many things. But God is with us through it, through it all. Amen? I'm, I'm fixing the end here. You know, um, there's a lot of things happening. You know, this system and all these churches, they're signed up with all the governments of the world. You got the UN. You got, uh, you got all these banks. Bank of America. You have a lot of banks that are tied with the system. I don't know if y'all knew that. You have all the secret societies. You have all these things that are controlling the world. And the church is the one pushing it. All major denominations and all major non-denominational churches are signed up with Rome. Rome is Babylon. And she has daughters. 
So all these churches are all tied together and they're working together with the governments of the world. Amen? There's going to be laws passed. And yes, we're to obey the laws of the land. But the minute laws are passed that go against God, whose laws do we follow? We follow God. Amen? And it's coming a time when the mark of the beast, that's when it will take place. And that's the choices we got to make. Are we going to accept what these churches are telling us to do and they go against God? Or are we going to accept what God wants us to do? And it says that in those days we'll have to leave the big cities. In those days we'll have to probably run to the hills. Just like they did during the time of Jerusalem. Are we so comfortable with what we have today with our jobs? You know, with our possessions, our new phones, our gadgets, our going out every weekend, right? We're so comfortable with that. Are we going to be able to run away? Or not run away, but be able to leave those things, right? And uh, escape, you know, the persecution, right? And even those that are persecuted, we're going to be thrown into prisons. Are we going to be willing to get our heads cut off? And stand up for Christ. Or are you going to give in? Right? These systems are all tied together. I'm going to share something else. I'm going to step out in faith and say this too. The 501c3. The 501c3 is, is for all non-profit organizations. The 501c3, every church has signed up with it. 99% of the churches are signed up with the 501c3. What is that? Where, they don't, where the church doesn't have to pay taxes. But, guess who owns the 501c3? The government. And did you know, I believe it was in 2007, 2007 or 2006, I'm not sure what year was that, they redid the law of the 501c3. Guess what that law is? Guess what they, how they redid the 501c3 law? They voted that the 501c3, anybody that's part of the 501c3, which is almost every church you can think of, and pastors, I'm preaching to you, to this, you, this, to you. In 2007, they redid the law of the 501c3. And the 501c3 is, the new law to it is, you cannot discriminate against women, and you cannot discriminate against homosexuals. Therefore, if a member of your church wants to be a deacon, an elder, or a pastor, and they're a woman or homosexual, you cannot tell them no. Because they can sue you. That's the new law they have added to the 501c3. And every church is signed up with the 501c3. If I was in charge of a certain denomination or a certain church, I would remove myself from that. Why? Because I'm subject to what the government tells me to do. That's why a lot of the churches were, that were against women being pastors, all of a sudden, oh, you know what? It's not that bad. Let's go ahead and, and we should have women be pastors. But they're not telling you is that new law that passed with the 501c3. That's what they're not telling you. But you know what? These denominations want to continue to get paid, right? If, I'm going to step out of faith, if the SDA church says, we're not going to allow women to be pastors, and we're not going to allow homosexuals to take positions in the church, Therefore, I'm gonna remove we're gonna remove the SDA church from the 501c3. 
guess what would happen? You would have members like we have right now. Guess what? They're not going to get paid because the general conferences are tied up with the government. Therefore, they don't want to lose their 501c3 status because pastors and churches want to continue to get paid. Colleges want to continue to get paid. And I'm not just talking about the, the SDA church, Baptist, Pentecostal, non-denominational, all these churches. Did you know that all churches get government funded? If you have 501c3, I don't care what church you go to, non-denominational, Pentecostal, Baptist, whatever church it is, did you know they're backed up by the government? Because you signed up with the 501c3. You belong to them now. So whatever they say, you have to do it. Unless you remove yourself from the 501c3. You see how, you see how the, all the governments of the world are working together with the church? Are we going to stand up to truth like Martin Luther did during the time of the Reformation? Or other people did? Other people lost their lives. They were taken to the stake and burned in, the, in front of everybody. In the streets. They were tied to a pole and they were burned alive. Is your faith that strong that you're able to stand for Christ? What about what happened in the shooting in Oklahoma, right? Was that in Oklahoma? When that girl, they asked her if she was a Christian. And she said yes. And they killed her. Is your faith that strong? We are, we are the church people. I don't care where you're at. You're the church if you're following God's truth. If you stand up for God's truth. Yes, we are still to love homosexual people. Yes, we are still, uh, women still, God still uses women. God uses women for, for them to go and uh, sp spread the gospel. But a pastor should be a man. Because that's the way God set it up. Right? If you want to argue, argue with God about that. Don't argue with, uh, with the pastor, right? <laughs> but God has his reasons. And we should be obedient to what God has called us to do. I don't know. I might be attacked for some of the things I've said but it's okay because I know God is with me I know God is with you we need to continue to preach the truth to everybody in love not in hatred we are to love everybody no matter what they find what what they're caught up in no matter what sins they're caught up in because we all sin we all fall short of the glory of God amen and we all need God's grace but we have to surrender it all to Him. Surrender it all to Him and He will change us. Come out of Babylon, people. That's what the three angels' message says. Come out of Babylon unless you receive a replace. Right? And you see the mark of the beast. Right? And we will cover that another day, what that mark of the beast is. But God wants us to come out. Come out of Babylon. My final verse, Revelation 21, verse 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 and 3. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in, from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Amen? God is there with us. We don't have nothing to be scared of. You know, uh, in China... The, the Christian people have to worship God and they hide they hide in the basements and they hide in different places to worship God and right now on the Sabbath they're coming together and they're hiding they're hiding in the Middle East in Iraq and Iran there's Christians 
they have to hide to to worship God and come together and worship God on the Sabbath. There's people all around the world. This reminds me of the story of Elijah. You know, Elijah got depressed. We all get depressed. Elijah got depressed. And he said, God, am I the only one serving you the right way? Sometimes it feels like that, right? It can feel like that right now. Look how many of us are here. Sometimes it's like, God, am I the only one trying to serve you the right way? And, the, and God tells Elijah, I have, I don't know how many he said, but he says, I have thousands of people around the world just like you that have not bowed down to Baal and served me. Baal was a false god that they worshipped back then. He's saying, you're not the only one, Elijah. It was one man standing up against all the city. Imagine if you were the only one person here in Amarillo trying to follow God. It was Elijah. And he got depressed. Okay, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm, I'm having Bible studies with people. I'm telling people about God. I'm telling people about the truth, about the Sabbath. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. But nobody listens to me. And God says, you're not the only one. I have people in Lubbock. I have people in Kansas. I have people in Oklahoma. I have people in Mexico. I have people in China. I have people in Africa. I have people all over the world just like you. They're trying to share the truth of God. Amen? That's the remnant. So let us continue to serve God no matter how many, how many people come to church, right? Let's continue because when we all are gathered together, in the new Jerusalem, there's going to be a lot of people there. Amen. And we're going to be surprised who's there and who's not, right? Amen. You're going to be like, man, I, I thought this famous preacher was going to be there. And God's going to say he's not here. Because they were caught up in Babylon, right? We don't want to follow tradition. We want to follow what God has for us. Amen. And that's what I wanted to present to you to, today to you guys. That that's the message of the three angels message. The angels, are, the angels are representative as messengers. Come out of Babylon, friends. And I hope that everybody watches this video. Because there, there needs to be an awakening. There needs to be a revival. Not a revival as us jumping up and down on these benches and... And rolling on the ground. And that's what the church calls revival today. That's what they call a revival. So when a church calls you and invites you to, to a revival. That's what we mostly expect. But God wants us to call us to a revival of our heart. Of our life. To follow him all the way. No matter what popular Christianity teaches. Right? I tell my wife. As I used to tell her back then. And I tell anybody, back then I was an elder of the church. I said, whether I'm an elder or not, I'm going to continue to preach the truth. And I tell you today, as a pastor, whether I'm a pastor of a church or not, I'm going to continue to preach the truth. Because I want to be obedient to the Lord. How about you? Do you want to be obedient to the Lord until He comes or the day that you pass away? Have you impacted somebody's life by sharing the good news with somebody? We need to share the good news with people. And there is so much more that I could have covered here. But God is giving you the wisdom. God is giving you the mind to study the book of Revelation. Study the prophecies in the Bible. Because these prophecies are for us to understand. Amen. Let us remember, you had old Jerusalem and you had old Babylon that were literal. Now we have the new Jerusalem that we're all looking forward to. And we have symbolic Babylon, which is substitute of God's truth. So Babylon is fallen, is fallen, has become a habitation of devils. We want nothing to do with Babylon. We want nothing to do with traditions of the church or Christianity. 
If they go against God, we don't want it. I don't care how much you love that church. If it goes against God, don't accept it. Amen? But if it's going for God and it's His truth, follow His truth. Amen? God bless you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything that you have done for us. And we thank you for uh, your son, Jesus, that he came and died on the cross for our sins, Lord. Lord, we just want to be obedient to you and do what you ask of us. Help us to remain faithful regardless of what's going on around us, Lord. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.